Thank you uh, for the introduction and, and thank you for having me. And I guess the slide will pop up any second. I can see it here and there it is as well. So uh, that's my title. And um, uh, Bioarctic is the company, as, as we've heard previously by Ole, uh, where he now is, he was in the audience before, we're world famous in Sweden, which is not, not a bad place to be, but it could obviously be better. Um, and uh, I can address that. One, you know, one of the things when you build a company is that um, uh, you need to be world famous in your own country before you can be it uh, globally. And up until I started a few years ago, uh, we, we never worked with communications, basically. I was, it was not a thing. Obviously, we did some things for the IPO, but we mostly worked on science and making sure that the company um, came all the way through to the market and the patients. So that was sort of the start of the journey. And now the second part of the journey is building a, yeah, I should just mention the disclaimer we listed on, on, on large cap Stockholm Nasdaq. <laughs> but the next step of our journey is to take the success of the first drug and build the leader, the global leader in neurodegenerative diseases. And the fun fact is even we're, if we're not well known generally globally um, on a broad scale in the general public, we're super well known in the Alzheimer's disease space. We're rock stars, rock, truly rock stars. When we uh, presented the data, or our partner ASI presented the data of the phase three study, which was an immense success at CTAD in San Francisco, 2022, November, we sat at the breakfast one morning, uh, myself, our CEO, and our founder, Lars Landfeld, the professor behind the idea and the science that has made us successful. And Lars went to get a cup of coffee for the breakfast. And one of the leading scientists in the world, Randy Bateman, at Wash U in the US, he came up to, he almost snuck up to our table as soon as Lars left. And he and bent over to Ganella and myself and he said, excuse me, do you think you can help us with a photo op with Lars? He's a rock star. <laughs> so that's how well known we are in the industry. We're working on the other part. We had a great, uh, uh, full spread in the Financial Times last year. And that was all due to a presentation like this, where there was a Financial Times journalist in the audience. But she, just like most, like Ola, didn't know that it was Bioarctic that was behind Lakembi, the big success. She thought it was Biogen. Because ASI, who we partnered with, they then partnered with Biogen to share resources and, and risk mitigation, etc. And then suddenly Biogen was smart, you know, Bioarctic, Biogen, it's almost the same name, let's just pretend it's us. And we'll just go along with it. And on every slide ASI has, they talk about their partnership with Biogen and rarely mentions Bioarctic. But it goes to show that even if we're not world famous, a small Swedish company can revolutionize treatment within the Alzheimer's disease space. It's been known as the graveyard, um, the graveyard of, of science of pharma, the last frontier. In the last 20 years, 50 billion US dollars have been put into this business, 50 billion US. 200 clinical trials in phase three. They've all failed, all failed up until we succeeded. And what's that done? It's shifted the mindset on most major pharma companies in the world where they were previously leaving neurodegeneration because it was too hard, too difficult, can't be done. You can't change it. It's all, we're all gonna die. They've changed and they're now coming back. They're now coming back to the industry. They all wanna be part of this because they see this as the next frontier. This is the new thing. This is what cancer was 10, 15 years ago. Suddenly there's an opening and we're behind that opening. And where do you go look if you want new modalities, new targets, new opportunities in the space? You go to the company who solved the issue, who were able to prove that it actually happens, who knows the science, and that's Bioarctic. So that, that's us in a nutshell. Questions, please? No, I'll, I'll go on. I have a few slides more, but not so many. Okay, so we want to change the neurodegeneration space, and we're on a good way to doing that. We started with Alzheimer's disease. We're already working on second generation Alzheimer's disease drugs, but I'll come back to that. But we're also in Parkinson's disease, starting in phase 2A. We're in ALS, bringing things, uh, moving forward towards IND. Um, and we have a technology that's called the brain transporter that I'll talk a bit more about as well. 
So just in a short summary, if you've not heard about Bioarctic more than that we're world famous in Sweden, is um, that we're basically a platform company. Uh, two platforms. One is we're best in the world when it comes to generating antibodies to target aggregating proteins in the brain. And why is that important? Because aggregation of proteins in the brain cause neurodegeneration. Uh, amyloid beta for Alzheimer's disease, alpha-synuclein for Parkinson's disease, TDP43 for um, ALS, and the list goes on. And we're best in the world. There is no company, Lilly, Novo, no company that's better than the 50, 60 scientists we have here in Stockholm. We've been, we've been, we've been able to do something that they can't. Lilly has now come with a success, a success, but it's not as good an antibody as ours. They're almost there, but they're not, they're not as good. We're the best in the world. That's the first part. The second part is our second, the second platform is what we call the brain transporter. Here we're not like you're leading in the world, but we think we're heading that way. Leader here is Roche. It's about transporting drugs into the brain, because when you do antibodies like we do, or larger molecules, antisense, uh, proteins, enzymes, and you want them to come in to treat uh, the brain, uh, brain disorders of different sorts, you have the blood-brain barrier in your brain. And it's a great way of keeping things out of the brain. But it also stops treatments from getting in. Out of, out of what we infuse in, in patients, less than 1% of the actual drug gets into the brain. And we need, to, we need to improve that because that will improve efficacy, it will reduce side effects, and it will improve the COGS, quite frankly, too. So we're working on a brain transporter system, and uh, I'll be able to mention that a bit more as, as well. Um, uh, and then, obviously, we're, we're, we've been profitable six or seven over the last uh, 10 years. We've got a big cash pile, so we can fund ourselves for 10 more months or so, but now royalties are starting to get in. I talked about our scientists. So just a quick look at the pipeline. We're more than just Lakembi, even that that's our first success. It's not going to be the only one. We're in Parkinson's disease, as I said, starting phase 2A. We have an earlier Parkinson's disease program, too, where we're now combining uh, a novel antibody with this brain transporter system to be able to get even more drug into the brain. Because Parkinson is, is sort of the next frontier now after Alzheimer's disease. It's very, they're very good symptomatic treatments, but no treatments that really affect the underlying disease. So that's what we're going to try to do there. The same with ALS, also naked antibody and an antibody coupled with a brain transporter technology system. So just quickly, uh, because the time is short, now the questions we mostly get is obviously now that we've gone into um, uh, actually starting to selling, our partners starting to sell the drug Lakembi, which is our first drug, is how is it going? And, and investors, frankly, have not been impressed. Investors thought that you would have an approval in the US, and then like a pill, you would just market it, and it would sell itself. And that's partly true. It does sell itself, but this is a drug that's, that's an, it's a novel drug, right? In the sense that you're totally shifting the treatment opportunities of a whole disease area. There has been no disease modifying treatment in Alzheimer's disease ever. There's symptomatic treatments. So you change the course of the disease for, for a small time, but if you stop treatment, you go right back down to where placebo were all gone. You're not changing the underlying course. What we've done is we've changing the course of the disease. You actually get more time as a patient. But to introduce that into a system where you have doctors who's not been able to treat the patients before, you need to find the right patients. You need to set up the infusion centers at the hospitals. You need to make sure that you can diagnose in a proper way, an efficient way. There are a lot of things that need to happen before you get that swirl. And we've been somewhat um, keeping back because of the fact that our partner promised 10,000 patients already by March this year. And that didn't happen. So the market's been a bit wary. Is this it really going to be a, that, you know, a big thing that people say? And, and we still believe it is, because what we're saying now is all the projections that we saw and heard from external and internal parties are basically happening but a quarter behind. So instead of 10,000 patients happening in March, it happens sometime mid-June. Uh, and the sales are taking off in the same direction. As you can see in this graph, I actually had an investor in, was that a J Japanese investor, who after the, face, the Q2 results came in, which this is our 
this is our uh, royalty stream. But you can imagine this, the, sales, the sales graph look exactly the same. It's just higher for ASI, obviously. But ASI had a question on their Q2 um, investor conference where, where, where an analyst said, when are you going to stop having a linear development of sales? I looked at this graph and I said, linear development? To me, this is exponential. I mean, linear, linear would have been 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.6. We're not, you know, we're at 42, 43, so it's not linear. It's taking off, and we see that everywhere. We're seeing that the big hospitals who started to introduce it to a few patients are now spreading it to their, the clinics around, their satellite clinics. Doctors are taking on more and more um, patients as well. We have clinics now that have two, 300 patients already. And the good addition to this is that we're getting more and more patients is that we're also seeing actual real-world clinical data. And that means that the people have been afraid of what happens when you bring this drug into the general public and maybe a broader patient population than you see in the drug, uh, in, in the trials. Are you going to, is that when I need to stop speaking or is that for questions as well? It Three. Is, uh, yeah. It okay. is time for you to wrap it up. I'm okay, I'm wrapping it up then. <laughs> Anyways, it's going to be a blockbuster, okay guys? So um, <laughs> just, <laughs> and actually now is a great time to invest, did I say that? So we'll skip this. I talked a bit about it. A lot of other things are happening, too, uh, when it comes to development. We're already working on next generation, as I said, Parkinson, etc. So if nothing else, remember this. Lakembi's sales growing fast. We're already selling in US, Japan, China. That's 80% of the world market. The, the, our share price took a hit by 34% on July 27th, 26th this year, when, the, uh, when EMA said that they weren't endorsing an approval. That's now being challenged, so it might happen anyway. But the share price went down 34% for a market worth approximately 12%. A bit of an overreaction. We already have approval for 85% of the potential world market. And now we see sales taking off like crazy. So and then early pipeline progressing well, and we've got finances that are solid. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. You've made it so interesting that people came in with so many questions. We'll have two and a half minutes to okay, finish them. We'll see. Fine. What are the chances of getting uh, it approved in EU or approved with restrictions? I think it's high, but it's difficult to put a number on it. I think, I think what we see in the reactions we've heard from EU representatives when they talk about why they didn't uh, recommend approval in the first instance um, is, is based on flawed science. They've, they've just, they just don't understand the drug or, or the numbers. Uh, we've seen that in the comments that they've given. Uh, on the other hand, they, do, they, they, they are afraid of the risks that you see in certain populations when it comes to side effects. And I think that the uh, UK, or Great Britain, I should say, have shown a path forward where they've ex excluded parts of the patient population, and then the, the number shifts totally. The, the side effect mm. profile becomes much better, and also actually the, uh, the effects uh, increase as well. So that could be a potential way forward, but it's difficult to speculate. I mean, we were very surprised when it wasn't recommended in the first place. So, and this whole process in, in the EU has been very strange compared to other markets. So it's diff difficult to speculate, but we're still very positive and, and think it's going to happen. On the same note, I think here is a question that relates a bit to it. Are governments taking responsibility in restricting health care to enable infusion therapies, do you think? Or will uh, companies need to make that happen? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's uh, difficult to blame your, if, if you're not successful, to blame it on the government is a bit, you know, it's a, it's a easy way out, but I don't think it's always true. If you have a good modality enough, a good treatment enough, and a, uh, you know, a good pitch enough for patients, I think it will sell itself. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to blame anything on the governments. But it is a big task if you get new treatments, new treatment modalities to introduce it into the market, because sometimes healthcare needs to change, or the patient mm. journey needs to change. That's what we've seen in the US and China, et cetera. Mm. We'll uh, finish up with a really critical question. Okay. Brace yourself. Um, what do you make of the slow pace of sales for Lembiqua in the U.S.? Uh, it's, it's not slow. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you it's, not as, it's not as quick as ASI promised in the beginning, but I think if you would adjust, adjust it for three months, it's exactly what they promised. So I think it's, it's slower than they promised, but it's taking off. 
Thank you so much for your presentations and the questions. Really interesting.